Good evening, everyone. We're looking at the offering and the crown tonight in the book of 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verses 6 through 8. The Apostle Paul said, Therefore, I am now ready to be offered in the time of my departures at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my corpse. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that also love is appearing. Previously, the Apostle Paul had pointed out that pastors have a responsibility to God and to the flock, and therefore uh, that responsibility is made very plain here in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, in verses 1 through 5. The responsibility is given not only in the presence of Almighty God, but His Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, our God, and the Lord of the gospel, whom we preach. Now then, the Apostle Paul said, preach the word. Why? Because it's inspired. In the book of 2 Timothy, we find in the third chapter, verses 16 and 17, he points that out, where he says, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Then he'll tell you that it's profitable for certain things. Then he said, also preach the word. Why? Because it alone is the message that God promises to bless. God doesn't bless fair weather messages. He blesses his word. This is why in Isaiah, the 55th chapter, and in verse 11, he says, uh, It shall not return unto me void, that is his word, and it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. And we're to preach the word simply because it alone is infallible. All right. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6 will tell you that. It says, and every word of God is pure. And for that reason, he says, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Then we are to preach the word, because God alone of all cannot lie. He tells of this when he speaks of our eternal hope in the book of Titus, the first chapter in verses 2 and 3, of which he says, of which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Now then, and he says, but hath in due times manifest his word through preaching. Interesting, is that not? And then preach the word, why? Because the word of God is the wisdom of God. Christ is not only the wisdom of God, he is the word which is the wisdom of God. And you'll find that, by the way, in the book of 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, verses 18 through 20. Then we are to preach the word because it is our main responsibility. You see, in the book of 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, the 17th verse, you'll find that the Apostle Paul pointed out, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now then, what follows in verse 6 of our reading tonight? is important because it must have brought sorrow to this young man, Timothy, as he began to realize that most likely he was reading the last words he would receive from his spiritual father in the faith and in the ministry. But on the other hand, the Apostle Paul, the, to, these, his, to the Apostle Paul, these words, by the way, were a welcome sight and they were words of great joy. You see, he was coming to the end of a long 
torturous journey. After all, it was the end of a constant battle that not only he fought in his lifetime after he followed the Lord Jesus Christ in salvation, but it's the same battle that we fight in our journey today. He was going to depart and be with the Lord, which he had said, by the way, which would be far better than this here was Paul's farewell address. And because of this, you're going to find that he simply says, I am now ready to be offered. To put it a little more literally, Paul was saying, I'm now being poured out as a drink offering unto the Lord. Now then. So don't forget, by the way, that it was the Apostle Paul who had said in Romans the 12th chapter in verse 1, Present your bodies a living sacrifice. In other words, he considered our service to God the only reasonable service. Now then, with that in mind, this had been the record of Paul's life, and the offering was coming to an end. Interesting, is it not, that of all the things that Paul had experienced in life, in serving the Lord, he had no regrets. Now then, so he looked around and he realized that his time was short, according to verse 6. And as a result of that, he accepts it by saying, the time of my departure is at hand. And he indicates those words with great anticipation. He says, I am ready. So for Paul, it was simply like a ship that was being loosed from its mooring and about to set sail. He looked forward to it with great anticipation. Now then, these two words, the words offered and the words departure, tell us of Paul's faith and it tells us of his confidence. You see, he was in effect saying, no one is going to kill me. I'm giving my life as a sacrifice for my Lord Jesus Christ. The word departure also means to take down a tent. Matter of fact, when you look over in the book of 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, in verse 1 through 8, you'll find that this is a parallel to what Paul is talking about when he compared the death of believers to the taking down of a tent, pulling up the stakes and moving on to a better place. You see, it was for the purpose of something far greater. Paul was looking for the, that time when he would receive a glorified body, when he would be loosed from that present wretched body and take on a glorified body which he called a house not made with hands back in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. So departure also has the, the meaning of loosing a prisoner. For as the Apostle Paul was concerned, you're going to find that he was facing a release, not an execution from the Roman. It's kind of hard to understand, isn't it? at first to know that he's a prisoner of rome he's about to be executed and he considers it facing a release instead of an execution departure has another meaning it means the unyoking of an ox now then when you look at this you'll find that paul had been in a hard and difficult service for many years serving his lord serving as master. And now then, the master was about to unyoke him and bring him on to greener pastures, to promote him to a higher place, a higher service. Anyone who has actually read the record of Paul's life knows that he wasn't boasting about himself. 
about all these things. Yet, in the verses that follow right here, he states clearly that he had done his job well and would be rewarded for it. That's not boasting. It was just a plain fact. He looked back at all that he had been through and he knew that that had pleased the Lord. And as a result, he would be rewarded for it. We know that whether or not we have served the Lord well, just as the Apostle Paul knew, all this has a twofold purpose. Matter of fact, not only for his own reflection and anticipation of what is coming, but also to encourage Timothy, by the way, a young man who would be left to carry on the work that Paul was about to finish as far as his course was concerned. Examining the facts, you look at the, fat, the fight, you see the finish line, and the faith that is involved in every bit of it. First of all, speaking metaphorically of the athletic contest, the Apostle Paul says, I have fought a good fight. Now that is, Paul was telling us that he had played by the rules that God had set. And those rules had been given to him and he had not cheated in running the course. Have you ever experienced what it actually feels like when you have done your very best at some particular work? You see, that's the feeling that Paul had when he had come to this point in his life. The words, I have fought a good fight, is an athletic image of a wrestler or a boxer. He had entered the contest with one thing in mind, that was to win. That's the way you and I should be. When we enter the race, when we enter the contest, we should have one thing in mind, and that is to win. Now then, actually what it is for us is to hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So you see, Paul had done his very best. Secondly, he says, I've finished my course. Now right here, he had run the race and he had come to the end at the finish line. And because of that, Paul says in Hebrews 12 and verse 1, to run with patience the race that is set before us. This is what he had done. And because of that, in a literal sense, he was saying, I've reached the end of my career. I've reached the end of the line. Now then. So, it had not been what he had thought things was going to be as a young man. It wasn't what he had his mind set to do or set to be. But, he totally and complete, in complete commitment accepted the career that God had assigned him with. And so he met it with joy. Just as the Lord had called him on the road to Damascus, his work began. Not the work that he started with young in life, but the work that God had called him to do in life. With that in mind, you're going to find his career as a special man, a minister, an apostle to the Gentiles, he had given his full commitment to that in order that he might serve the Lord without reservation whatsoever. So he had laid his life on the line many times with one thing in mind, to achieve, to achieve God's purpose. Paul had indeed finished the course. And finally he says, I've kept the faith. Verse 7. There can be no doubt that the Apostle Paul, by using the word, the definite article, the, in the faith, he had finished his course, the faith, once delivered to the saints, 
as spoken of in Jude 3, is what he was referring to. As far as he was concerned, you see, there was never any thought of compromising the inspired record that had been given him. He had not only kept it pure in his preaching, but he had also kept it pure in his daily life. You see, the two things go together, our testimony and our walk. That's the way it was with Paul. So he demonstrated this over and over and again in his life when it came to the truth of God's word. And that simply stating a fact that the faith constitutes the whole of the New Testament fortified by the Old Testament teachings that we see as well. So to keep the faith, that allows no nitpicking and no choosing as to what we believe and as to what we will practice. It involves not only teaching, but also living. And it involves our attitude in doing so as well. Our work, our firmness in delivering God's word and practicing it must be saturated with love. This is sometimes difficult, but it is definitely essential. Paul had not deviated from the word of God and its truths. He not only believed them, he practiced them. When Paul looked back over his service to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to find that he had no regrets whatsoever. No, he wasn't always popular, and nor was he usually comfortable as many of us are today. But one thing is for sure, he kept the faith once delivered to the saints. You see, to the Apostle Paul, this is what really counted in life, his life. He uses the word henceforth in view of all these facts, verse 8. Because of these three facts in Paul's life, he says, I fought a good fight, I finished the course, and I've kept the faith. There it is without question. Paul says, henceforth. As a result of all this, in looking forward, there is no regret. You see, Paul was ready to experience Romans 8:18. 8, the sufferings of this present world are simply not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So for Paul, this included a crown of righteousness. This was distinctly a crown of honor, a crown for a winner. And he was a winner, as in the athletic games. You see, that was the victor's crown that was in the athletic games. Paul was going to be, get, be given not a fading crown of leaves, but his crown would be a crown of righteousness. As a champion of the faith, Paul had won a crown of honor. So as a result of it, this is a crown of righteousness. It was an eternal crown which would not fade away. And as a result, not only had Paul won the crown, but that crown would be presented to him in the person by a righteous judge. We see men honored today personally by presidents and by kings. But let me tell you what, those things do not compare to the glory, the honor that a child of God will have when they stand before their Lord and their King, their Savior, the Creator of heaven and earth. And as a result of it, He personally gives a crown for serving him faithfully. Such a crown is not forgotten, but a such a crown is the kind of crown 
that you'll want to lay at your master's feet one day. So you see, this is an honor that is reserved not only for the Apostle Paul, but he says, all for all them that lo also love his appearing. The word appearing here is the word epiphany, our Lord's public manifestation. It's one thing to expect the Lord's appearing. It's quite another to love it and to look for it with a fond anticipation. You see, those who are faithful servants are one day going to look for the Lord with great anticipation. Why? So they can receive a reward? No. Because they love Him instead. The other things are just benefits of serving faithfully. You see, I'll conclude with this thought. I'm sure there's going to be some surprises at the judgment seat, no doubt. Yet, no one can really love his appearing if they're not serving him faithfully. So if you live in obedience to the Lord and his will, if you do the work that God has laid on your heart, then understand, one day you too will receive a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, your righteous judge, shall give you in that day, not only to you, but unto all those that love is appearing. So, how you look at this, how you live, how you respond to the serving the Lord, ah, and look forward to his return with the fond anticipation is determined by your close relationship to the Lord. Paul had that. That's why you could see that he was ready to be offered and he looked forward to it with great anticipation. May God bless you and you have a great evening. Good night.